Hello and welcome to another Zuzin session. How about that? How about that? So today we're actually doing the session during the night because a lot of people don't like that I program in Rust. But despite all the hate, I'm continuing programming in Rust, but at night, so nobody knows. Nobody, don't tell anyone that I'm programming in Rust right now. So uh, for the past several streams, we were developing um, this thing. Uh, and this thing is basically a simple playground project to explore uh, uh, this format, that video, this video format. So uh, the point of exploring this video format is actually rather interesting. So basically i wanted to try to find an equivalent for uh something like ppm image format but for the videos and the ppm image format is actually quite fascinating it's a simple uh, raw image format a uh, very very simple one and uh so you don't even need any library support to generate ppm images you can just write some code in any language that can output bytes to the to the file system and just generate that image and uh this image is going to be viewable by the viewers that do support this um this format and there's quite a few of them that support this kind of format specifically fer does in fact support ppm format and as far as i know image magic can convert images from ppm to for instance png or to jpeg or whatever the uh, the image format it supports so the cool thing about that is that uh, it's really convenient to use for debugging purposes when you have something visual to debug that is really difficult to understand uh, by stepping through in the debugger right uh, but you can just dump some visual thing and just see that there is a bug somewhere there Right, and uh, it's not convenient for uh, storing images and for transporting images over the web because it's raw, it's uncompressed, uh, but that's not the point. I think it's not really suitable for like storing images or transferring them, right? It's more like suitable for debugging things. And I want you to have something similar something similar for video formats right some raw video format that is super easy to just generate from any language uh and then like use it for debug purposes right output some like animation information and uh this is the format that i found and it is in fact quite simple right it is in fact quite simple and we managed to uh write a small program that generates video in that specific format and we wrote that in rust and it doesn't use any dependencies it just like directly outputs the the, the bytes and uh, everything works so you can find the source code of this thing in the description if you're watching on youtube if you're watching on twitch right now you can find that in the chat and also if you want to become a youtube person and you can check out the what's channel <sighs> so uh the source code the source code of today's thing right there we go to unpack for you uh so let's take a look at it uh so the the project is rather simple you just use the rust c compiler we're not using cargo because it is not needed right so there is no need for any dependency management or anything like that you can just take a single rust file and compile it to program so uh, it's, it's better to enable all of the optimizations because this thing otherwise will be extremely slow so let's actually compile everything and let's generate the video so it's gonna take some time because uh, machine is rather slow right now because I'm also streaming so yeah but it will generate like 16 seconds of a video right and the size of the video is gonna be one like 1.3 gigabytes which actually, you know, <laughs> confirms that this format is not suitable for storing videos or for transporting videos over the internet or over the network, right? So, first of all, it takes too much time to generate and the outcome is rather huge, 1.3 gigabytes for 16 seconds of video. But that's not the point. My point is to find a video format that is suitable for debugging purposes, right? I want to be able to just output things and like debug them. So uh, let's take a look at them player and uh, I'll put a Y for M. There we go. So that, that's the video that we managed to generate in Rust directly into that format. So pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. So <clears throat> that is in fact a rather cool. Okay, so, and just to show you, just to, 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 uh, to confirm my point, if you try to use something like FFmpeg, uh, and you try to convert this entire thing. And by the way, you can convert videos uh, like FFmpeg does support this format. 
right as well as M player right as well as M player uh, as you can see so M player can play that VLC can play that so all of the players that, like do support this format and we didn't need any third party dependencies to generate that video that's the coolest thing about that video format which is directly wrote some bytes without special library without special compression without like anything and uh now i can use vlc to view that video i can use m player to view that video i can use ffmpeg to convert that video to something else right so i can recon uh, like basically convert it to output mp4 right uh and this is going to be a completely different format and you will see how small this image will become because because it will be compressed right so all of these gigabytes will be compressed as into i think it's going to be less than megabyte i think maybe it's going to be megabyte or something we'll, we'll see i don't remember for sure but it's definitely not going to be a gigabyte um so it's interesting that the video we generated in 60 fps but it converted it in 30 fps you see so it converted it twice as slow as playback Right, so conversion is slower than the playback in this particular, which which makes sense, I suppose. Uh, right, so and this basically the uh, compressed video. So the compressed version of this thing is two megabytes. Okay, so one point three gigabytes was converted to to uh, two megabytes, and we can take a look at the entire thing in MP4, and it's pretty much the the same thing, but it's just smaller. Right, so if you have a FFmpeg in any uh, in any language, you can just generate a video and convert it to something else without installing a library for for that specific uh, for that specific language you can use rust c uh, c++ javascript python anything that can output bytes right so but there is a drawback to this format that we discovered while exploring it and the drawback is the fact that instead of rgb it is using um ycbcr so this is the color spray that is using it's using ycbcr and the problem with YCBCR is that if you want to generate images in RGB, it is kind of hard to convert them to YCBCR. So let's actually take a look at what's going on here. So the formula of conversion RGB to YCBCR looks like this. So that's the function that takes RGB pixel and converts it to YCBCR. And this is how it looks like. So even though this format doesn't require any third party dependency, this is the formula that you have to memorize if you want to uh, generate RGB images, right? Because you cannot uh, generate RGB images and just save them as RGB, you have to convert them to YCRCB. So that uh, actually creates a problem. But uh, what you can do, I suppose, you can generate images directly in YCRCB, right? So you can generate them directly in YCRCB. In, in that case, it's kind of like the, the color space itself, YCRCB color space is kind of wonky, right? But you can kind of get used to it. And if the purpose of your debugging is not the color, if you're not debugging the color, but rather emotion of something, maybe you don't have to remember this formula. Just uh, generate directly like two different colors or three or how many colors you need uh, in YCRCB and you're going to be good to go. So I guess it's you can still salvage this format for some sort of debugging purposes, but uh, it's kind of I, I wish it was um, you know basically ppm, but for the video, right? So everything is perfect with this format. Can we just swap out YCRCB to RGB? <laughs> that would be actually ideal. That would be actually ideal. In that case, I could just like generate some debug information with the uh, with the knowledge I have and don't worry about anything. So, but it is what it is. This format is still useful for for something, I suppose. But to be fair, while I was playing with this format, right, and trying different things, uh, the entire project went kind of outside of the scope of simple video format. As you can see, we managed to generate pretty cool pictures here, right? We managed to generate pretty cool pictures. And um, so that gave me an idea. Uh, maybe I also want to generate some sounds for this video. Maybe when the uh, rectangles collide with the wall, they will actually produce some sort of like a sine wave and maybe we can make those sine waves harmonize, right? Depending on the size of the rectangle, it will play different notes and those notes together harmonizes in chords or something like that, right? So and maybe that will create an interesting music, like ra randomized music of, of things harmonizing together. So this is what I want, want to try to do. 
And uh, how we can do that, we can basically generate a sound in a separate file in a PCM format. So PCM format is kind of like a PPM, but for the sound, right? So it's also a raw format. It's also raw format and it stores the raw um, uh, sound wave. And uh, yeah, so I just realized that I have three raw formats that I can use to debug things. PPM, PCM for sounds and... Um, uh, U4 and pack 2 for, for the videos, right? So, and if we generate the sounds like in parallel, maybe we'll be able to merge them together to like a sound and video with FFmpeg and see how this entire thing sort of generates the music, if you know what I'm talking about. Right, so, and that's gonna be the topic of today's stream. All right, so um, yeah, so that's basically everything I wanted to say. So, and let's go ahead and start working on this entire thing. But before we start working on this entire thing, I wanted to refactor this code a little bit, because as you can see, uh, the code, there is some sort of interesting pattern that emerges in that code. And that pattern is that we have a code related to saving and encoding anything, everything for video format, right? So it's a sort of separate part of code and the code that is uh, generating the frames. And the code that generating the frames doesn't really care about YCRCB or MPEG2 or any of this stuff. It's sort of like independent and the only purpose of that code is just to generate animations. It's, it's some sort of like a simulation engine. Right, and I want you to extract that simulation engine into a separate module that knows nothing uh, about where its frames go. Right, so, and then once we experiment enough, maybe at some point we're gonna write uh, like some sort of like a um, wrapper that takes the same simulation engine and renders it to OpenGL just to see like how it's rendered in real time. Because right now we have to wait for the video, which is not really convenient if you wanna just watch the animation and simulate it in real time. So maybe you'll be able to do that, right? So I wanna do something like that. So we're gonna have separate module for just rendering the animation, right? just rendering the animation and a separate module for rendering this animation into the video file and then separate module for uh, rendering this thing into the OpenGL texture, for instance, right? And maybe later we can add more uh, sort of uh, platforms and more ways to output things. So that's gonna be basically the idea of this refactoring. So let's actually commence the refactoring and uh, yeah. <clears throat> so let's go. Um, so what am I going to do in here? I'm going to actually create a to-do list. <sighs> so let's call this thing, um, oh my god. Uh, uh, extra, factor out, I think that's a better way to call it. Factor out the simulation module, right? So simulation module. Uh, generate uh, the sound for the, for the video. Um, and I suppose the third point here is going to be um, implement implement the open uh, GL renderer for the simulation, right? The open GL renderer for the simulation uh, that renders the frames uh, into an open GL texture or something, open GL texture. But it would be better if the uh, such texture was um, I don't know, maybe maybe not. We'll see. We'll see. Mm, we'll see, we'll see. So, because it would be better to use shaders for this kind of stuff, but I think I'm looking too much into the future. I, I don't think we have enough information to see how exactly we're going to be generating all of these things. All right, so let's create a separate module, and this separate module is going to be called Sim, right? So, for simulation, and uh, I'm going to start actually coding, uh, copying things uh, from the main module to that simulation module. Uh, John Pung Thong, hello, hello, welcome to the stream. How are you doing? So, uh, why CBCR is not uh, separate from rendering? So the thing that we need in here, I suppose, is HSL to RGB. This is sort of like a platform independent thing. Feel direct. <laughs> uh, okay, so feel direct. I'm gonna actually take this thing. So this function basically uh, renders the rainbowish rectangle. So. <laughs> Rect in this particular case stands for rectangle. Okay, so let's actually actually specifically say that I mean rectangle and nothing nothing else. 
right? Because people may not understand it correctly. So we're creating like a rainbowish thingy in here. So we'll see, I'll pull MP4, and that function specifically just renders this rainbowish rectangle. That's why it's called like that, okay? So rect stands for rectangle, okay? Uh, so another one is just a fill RGBA rectangle and we use it for cleaning things up. Uh, right, so, and this one is gonna be a uh, rectangle, right, so here is a rectangle. So canvas is frame is not needed, say frame is not needed, rect is needed because it's a single rectangle that we're simulating. Orientation is basically a description how exactly rectangle hit the wall, did it hit the uh, horizontally or vertically. So that information is then used to, to split things around. Uh, and then we have a couple of things for uh, the rectangle in here. Uh, and then we have a little bit of code that performs the simulation, right? It performs the simulation. Uh, so maybe before actually creating a separate module, I want to create some sort of like a state entity that encapsulates all of that code so I can easily move it to a separate module. Right, so that's going to be the idea in here, if you know what I'm talking about. I think that it's going to be a little bit better. Okay, so I think I'm going to do that. So b because of that, uh, because I want to do, do the refactoring the other way around, I'm going to be actually discarding all of my changes in here, right? So I'm discarding all of that. And uh, I'm going to first extract the state of the simulation, right? So I'm going to extract the state of the simulation. And state of the simulation is going to be consistent of rectangles, list of the rectangles, and then list of splitting of the rectangles. So basically every time rectangle hits the wall, it gets into the split list. And from that list, we generate more rectangles. And that's how the animation is actually playing, right? So every time rectangle hits the wall, it gets into the split list and split list actually splits the rectangle more and more. And this is how we get this like entire chaos uh, happening on the screen. And I wanna extract all of that stuff into like a separate entity that is easy to move to a different module. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. If that makes any sense, of course. So yeah, that's basically what we do. Uh, okay, so of course I want to actually rename this entire thing to something like that. Boom. Mm. To something like that. And let's actually do the renaming first of all. Right, so this is basically a rename this to uh, this. Right, so this is going to be like that. I'm going to push that right into the repo. I'm going to push that right into the repo. What distro are you using? The Linux distro. Okay, so uh, I want to introduce an entity called struct state. And the state is going to hold two things. It's going to hold rectangles, rects, uh, right? So this is going to be rect and two split, I suppose, two split. Uh, and it's going to store a pair, right? So, and that pair is going to be basically the index within the rects uh, that you need to split, right? And the orientation, how exactly you have to split. All right. So after that, we probably need to create a constructor for the entire state, right? So this is going to be a new. And uh, what we're going to put in new, I think, I don't know. Let's put nothing in there, right? So, and then it's going to return self. So in here, uh, we're gonna just construct um, the uh, the rectangles, right? So this is gonna be basically uh, vec new. I don't remember if this equal or colon. So the compiler will tell me actually. The compiler will tell me if it's equal or something else. Okay. So let's try to recompile the entire thing. All right. So it's gonna be Rust C main.rs. <sighs> so it has to be colon, of course. Sure. Okay, so uh, state is created successfully. And maybe another thing that we want to do in here is uh, sort of pre-push some rectangle in there. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. So um, I'm really, really not sure. I suppose I, I think I can do that. Okay, so let's just create a rectangle somewhere here. So this is going to be a rectangle new. Right, and then I'm going to put the rectangle in here. And then we're going to sort of pre-push uh, the entire thing uh, like this, right? So we pre-pushed it. Uh, we pre-pushed it. And now we don't really need anything here except the state, the state of the simulation. State new, there we go, there we go. 
So, and let me just go through the entire thing and see how it's going to go. So I also probably want to rename uh, fill that with uh, angle, right? Just to be consistent throughout the code base. And let's just try to compile the entire thing. So here we iterating the, uh, the stuff. I suppose all of that could be moved to a separate method of the state. It could be something like update, right? Which takes the mutable self, right? It takes the mutable self and it will update everything in here. Right, so uh, we're going to be iterating through the rectangles, uh, then we're going to be doing all of that. And uh, I suppose that is it. I can just move everything to here. Right, I'm moving everything to here. So, and in here, I'm going to be just calling state update. Right, so as you can see, a huge chunk of the code uh, moves to this specific method. Moves to this specific method. So in here we have to do self. Uh, so canvas. Okay, canvas is basically something external, as far as I can tell. So we'll have to accept that canvas somewhere here. So it's going to be canvas, uh, mutable canvas, actually u32. And here we're going to be accepting also canvas stride. Right. So this is going to be canvas stride. Canvas stride. There we go. So, uh, do we need anything else? Probably not. So, since this thing is mutable, maybe we don't even have to do it like that. Right. So, what else do we have in here? Frame. Canvas save as frame. All right, this one is rather interesting. I think this should not be part of the state update. I think it has to happen after we updated the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially we ask the state to render into the canvas, right? So we render into the canvas and then we take that canvas and we convert it to a frame and then we save in that frame to the sync. Okay, this is actually pretty straightforward, you see? We are rendering the state into the canvas and uh, doing this kind of thing. So maybe since we're updating and rendering, it would make sense to actually call it update and render right update and render or maybe we can have um i don't know separate notions in here separate methods to update the thing and separate methods to render maybe because uh in the future you want to uh, only simulate things but not really render them right so maybe you want to simulate several steps before actually rendering the thing so maybe it would make sense to separate this kind of stuff mm -mm. Makes sense, makes sense. Flasha, LMIO, hello, how are you doing, Flasha? Uh, do you flush your streams? <clears throat> okay, so, I'm sorry. Um, it is very important to flush your streams, otherwise you won't be able to see the whole output. Mm, all right, so what do we have in here? So here's the rect, uh, and uh, here is another one, self. Mm -mm -mm. Kick slash R. Okay. All right. So to split, it's gonna be two. Uh, it's gonna be self, right? So another one is gonna be self. So all of this stuff is just self. Mm -hmm. Explicit is better than implicit. Am I right, fellow Python developers? Uh, so update and uh, and render. So that's basically what we have here. We have update and render. And um, so canvas as mutable, uh, that's not declared mutable. Uh, that's really strange. Oh yeah, yeah, so basically I have to do something like this. Mm, okay, so it seems to be compiling. It seems to be compiling. So let's actually compile all of that with optimizations. Op OPT level is gonna be three. And let's see if we didn't break anything, right? Let's see if we didn't break anything. Let's actually generate the thing. Let's actually generate the thing. Pogress. Pogress. So. Mm -mm. Generated output Y for M. Y for M. M player output uh, actually Y for M, right? And something went wrong. We did a fucky wacky. Oopsie doopsie. I wonder what went wrong though. Why I didn't generate anything? <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, 
so yeah this kind of strange right so we rendered the entire thing and it didn't really work so we updated and rendered and it just did nothing <clears throat> so two, 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 two. so i don't really know what exactly is wrong in here so maybe i'm gonna actually extract the operation of rendering just in case so the rendering is going to be actually uh immutable right and the only mutable thing in here is going to be the canvas right so there we go so and the way we're rendering in fact is just like this right so we're just uh, iterating everything and we're rendering everything into the canvas and when we're about to update something we're just doing this kind of stuff okay so we have two separate operations here render and update so in here what i want to do in fact i want to render everything into into this thing um we also oh oh yeah i see because the first operation actually renders everything and the second operation actually cleans everything and the way we clean everything we clean each individual rectangle but what i'm thinking is that it's, it's not really convenient because you basically do too many rectangle operations it would be easier in our case to actually do like a whole uh like a whole feel of the of the frames maybe that will actually make it faster because that way you have less maybe cache misses and stuff like that it's rather interesting actually which one is going to be faster i really want to know that so okay i'm going to explain what i mean i'm going to explain what i mean mm, two, 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 two. so i'm going to start my paint so you have a canvas, right? You have a canvas and uh, on each frame on the canvas, we draw a bunch of rectangles, right? We drew a bunch of rectangles like this uh, and so on and so forth. Right. So then we take this canvas and we save it as a frame. So, and then we want to clean that, uh, that canvas. What do we do? We go through all the rectangles yet again and paint over them with a background color right with the background color effectively erasing each an individual rectangle right so it's one approach right so this approach is good when you have uh, like a few amount of rectangles so you avoid cleaning up everything but because of the way our animation works right so if you take a look at our animation right we have shed ton of rectangles so maybe it doesn't really make sense to clean the entire thing uh on the level of each individual rectangle because it may take a lot of time and i wonder would like just cleaning up the whole canvas, speed up the whole rendering. Well, it definitely will make the code simpler, but we would also benefit from like speeding things up because we have so many rectangles. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, right, so, and this is something that I want to test right now. Uh, so let me actually see, because it's not that difficult to implement. Um, right, so I'm going to actually stash everything uh, and I'm going to recompile everything now. <laughs> Mm, profile it. I, I don't really want to do any like serious profiling. I think I'm going to be just using the time uh, function since the rendering takes so much time. I think the resolution of time is going to be fine, right? So it takes on a level of like tens of seconds, all right? So and I think for, for this kind of resolution, time is fine, right? And if there will be any benefit on the level of each individual frame, I think it will accumulate and will it will be visible with time, right? So I'm not going to do any sophisticated profiling or or whatnot. Right. Also, I think bottleneck uh, of this entire process is actually hard drive because I'm saving to the hard drive on each individual frame. Uh, we can actually do it like a couple of times, like three times maybe just to test things out. Yeah, I did buffer right. That's why it sort of stalled after printed generated output. Uh, yeah. Look, 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 it's going to finish and it's going to say generated file, but it won't finish. You see, it's st the program still hasn't finished, even though it actually printed the generated output. This is because uh, then the, the output was buffered, right? Then we went out of the scope and that closed the buffered uh, writer. And because it was buffered uh, while closing, it was flushing all of its output. So basically what it's waiting in here, it's basically flushing everything that it's promised to write to the output, but didn't because it's buffered, right? So that's why it stalls a little bit. 
Um, so we're gonna actually do it three times uh, just to you know get some you know, some good measurement. So it's around like 26, 24 seconds or whatnot. I suppose it's gonna be around like 24, 26. I don't think it's gonna be that much different. Uh, all right, so yeah, 25, essentially 25 seconds. Mm, two, 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 and I'm just gonna save this entire thing in here. Okay, so let's go ahead and change the entire thing. Right. Uh, change the entire clean up to just fill in the whole thing. So uh, I can just go ahead and do it like this. So here is the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And let's compile. Okay. And uh, let's go over. Is it going faster? I wonder. We're about to find out. Valini. Thank you so much for uh, three months. Circus. <laughs> thank you so much for three months of Twitch Prime subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome to our Epic Circus Club. Mm, so, what playlist do you use from? I'm using something called the Pretzel Rocks. Uh, just a second. I'm gonna wait until it's finished. Twenty-seven seconds. It's actually get uh, uh, slower. Pretzel. Uh, rocks. So it's a thing for streamers and essentially it's a stream safe music that doesn't get you DMCA'd. Right, so this thing automatically just picks up the music by genre and on top of that if you look closer at the chat there is a Pretzel Rocks bot which spits out the currently playing music every time it's changing so if you want to know the currently playing song just scroll up in the oh my god just scroll up in the chat and you will see that so valani thank you so much for uh how many 10 gifted subs uh tier one subs thank you thank you thank you and uh, yeah uh, i guess it's gonna play for a while so i'm gonna quickly pause the recording uh and then we're gonna continue all right thank you thank you for all the subs and let's uh, continue programming oh so uh yeah what we wanted to see uh we want to see if this thing is faster and as you can see it is not faster in fact <laughs> i think it, it i think it is slower apparently it is faster to actually clean everything yeah it is faster to clean everything rectangle by rectangle because it, it is slower but it's slower like for like a second or something so i don't really know uh, i don't know man i don't know so it's around like 27. But we are actually cleaning everything up in a very inefficient way. Yeah, it's, it's definitely slower. We're cleaning everything uh, in a very inefficient way. We're using Field Rector GBA, uh, which is actually doing a lot of like this stuff, uh, mathematics and boundary checks and stuff like that. And it needs to do boundary checks in case you provide a rectangle that goes outside of the boundaries and stuff like that. We can actually clean the canvas in a much more efficient way. So the canvas you see is just a vector. So we can do something like canvas fill background. And you don't need to compute any um, boundaries. You need to do, don't need to do any boundary check. You just say, fill the whole canvas with the background. So, and it's going to be fine. Right, so um, uh, let's actually uh, recompile the entire thing. Mm. Okay, so it's around like 29 or something. Mm. So apparently it is faster to just go through all of the rectangles and clean them up separately. You just clean less amount of rectangles, I suppose. 26. Uh, well, let's actually do the third one. Mm -hmm. 
So Cargo allows you to uh, use uh, other people's work easily. Why it is this used to you? Because package managers like Cargo, NPM and the other things, they deceive you into thinking that uh, dependencies are free. And when you realize that they are not free, it is too late and uh, your project is already falling off completely. But I'm not saying that you should not use it, right? If you want to use it, if it enables you to use other people's work, Go ahead and do that. I'm just saying it. This is the reasons why I personally wouldn't use that, uh, because I want to see what exactly is going on when I'm adding dependencies, and I want to have control of that, because I've been burned by that exact things thing multiple times when I was developing medium to big projects. So does it make sense to you? I'm not saying that you shouldn't use that thing or it's bad or anything. If you want to use it, if it helps to you to get your uh, shit done go ahead that's fine that's good so i'm just saying that in my case i've been burned by these package managers and i actually tried more than just cargo npm i actually use this kind of package managers in other uh, languages and they always deceive you into thinking that the dependencies is free but the more dependencies you add the more uh, control you lose right and that's something that i don't like in my project so yeah does it make sense to you does it answer your questions does it answer for your concerns? Want to use these package managers? Go ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Trust me. Uh, <clears throat> this is just my reasons. Right? So everyone is different. Everyone is doing different things. Uh, I'm doing my thing. You're doing your thing. Mm, plus, you know 100% of what the code does. Uh, it's not always useful, right? If you want to quickly get to the market, quickly just do something and you don't care about the quality, knowing 100% of what code does is not particularly useful. It only distracts you from your goal. But if that's not your goal, if your goal is to actually have more control, then yeah, maybe that's useful. So you see, it's different, right? It's kind of different. So the, the thing that upsets me about the package managers is that, and why I call it a disease, is that it's kind of like the entire system deceives you into thinking that dependencies are free, right? So if the system somehow was more explicit uh, about how much you pay for adding the dependency, it would be a little bit better, I think. But that system doesn't even do that. It's like, yeah, it's look, it's a dopamine hit. It's so quick. Look, I throw out dependencies and I have a working thing. Oh my god, this is a new startup. But in reality, over time, it may die in half of a in half of a year because somebody removed left pad from npm or something like that. And it's just like, yeah, it's it's really bad, right? At least people should be aware of what exactly they are paying, right? And again, I'm not saying that using dependencies is bad. Again, because every time I say these kind of things, people think that I'm saying the using dependencies is bad, cargo bad, but it's everything. I'm not saying that. It's just like, oh my god, binary thinking. Think is either bad or good, right? Anyways, um, Balik Zero is gifting one tier one sub uh, to the Tony community. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. All right, project where I write most of the packages and use package manager to reuse them. All, all power to you. If that's what you want to do, go ahead and do that. Um, so, all righty. So, uh, I think we're gonna actually switch to uh, just using Canvas Fill. I think it's a feasible solution. And furthermore, in this specific project, this is a throwaway project to test uh, the simple format. And it definitely not gonna benefit from Cargo. It's just not gonna benefit. So there's no point in using uh, this thing for me. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm. NPM packages cannot be removed if they are used. There is a time limit when something... Well, that changes everything. Now, yeah, that invalidates everything I said, of course. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You're just 
facts and logic facts and logic uh so uh yeah i think well what was doing okay so looks all right uh, so we're gonna go with this kind of thing. So now uh, we won't even have to worry about this stuff. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so we explored how to do the clean, right? So let's talk about, uh, you know, the actual nuclear plant. It's kind of cool to discuss the color of the shed. Uh, we exchanged some opinions. As you can see, I like the red bike sheds, and that's why I wear the red shirt. You apparently like uh, green bike sheds, and that's totally fine if that's your thing, right? You know, so you want to basically blend with the environment. The color of the bike shed is pretty cool. But now let's go back to discussing the nuclear plant architecture. So the, the actually difficult thing that we're trying to do in here. So yeah, and the actual difficult thing in here, uh, we need to decide how exactly we're going to be cleaning up the, um, you know, the frame, right? How exactly we're going to be cleaning uh, that up. And so we decided we're going to use canvas fill, right? I, I do understand that it's not as interesting as watching like a day in the life of software engineer or discussing whether NPM good or bad. I do realize that, but that's what we do on the Tony channel. As I already said, I love programming more than being popular. So um, that's what we're going to continue doing. I'm really sorry about that. So um, yeah, let's reverse the entire thing. Um, and let's continue. So uh, here is, I already extracted everything in here. So, and here we do clean up. So I'm going to actually remove this clean up from here. Uh, and uh, so we rendered the state and we then saved it as a canvas, saved the frame. So maybe I have to actually take the canvas, the canvas, uh, and just fill everything with uh, the background color, right? So there we go. And then we rendered the entire state in the canvas, we save it as a frame, and we save the frame into the sync. And then I'm gonna do a state update, and that should be fine, I suppose. So that should actually do the thing. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Ten years from now, washed out, surging popping off on YouTube channel with life advices for programmers. <laughs> yeah, I feel like like a lot of things I constantly push and say. Um, there, people are not really ready for that yet, I don't know. Uh, so a lot of things that I complain about, they start to become a problem when you program for quite some time. And I'm gonna tell you what I mean. So for me, I actually, like I program for 15 plus years. 15 plus years, right? It's not that much, it's not as much as Casey or John, right? So um, Casey was programming for 30 plus years and John, he's almost 50 and I think he was programming since he was five or something like that. Like these kind of people were programming pretty much their entire life or something. Uh, so I'm definitely not on their level. They're completely different levels. So, so but, but they've been programming for a little bit, right? So, and I was burned like quite a few times when I wrote a piece of code on a new shiny technology and in five years I couldn't compile this piece of code because not only the syntax of the language that I was using changed but also completely standard library and that piece of code is completely dead so the language it's written in does not exist what yeah, yeah yeah elm is one of the examples but not only elm i actually had a similar things right so basically i had that thing multiple times right so for that to become a problem you have to program at least more than five years so even if I say that it is important for me for uh, my code to survive for five years and people don't understand that, maybe this is because they didn't program long enough for them to for, for, for them to be for that become a problem. You know what I'm talking about? So it's just like, yeah, I personally don't like that because I was personally burned by that too many times. Right. So and I'm too tired to rewrite my projects over and over again. So I just want to have something that is stable and will survive at least at least a year i'm not asking for five years at least a year just give me a year some of the new things they don't survive like a month or something it's just like so frustrating uh so yeah and it's just like yeah 
And people do not accept that as an argument. And the only explanation I see is that maybe they don't program long enough for them to be, for them, this to become a problem. So that's the only explanation I see. I know. I know. Maybe over time they will understand that, but maybe that's not, it's not the time yet. Um, all right. <clears throat> so uh, let's go. Uh, so what do we have in here? So we managed to compile everything. Let me recompile one more time. And uh, I'm gonna just run the entire thing and let's see if that still works, if that still works. M player uh, output Y for M and we fix that. So uh, now we're actually cleaning everything up like completely. So we can uh, clean the whole con canvas. So I think I'm going to do a committee committee uh, here. And I'm going to say that we extracted this state, uh, rather factored out, factor out a simulation uh, state, right? Factor out the simulation state. And I'm going to push that right into the repo. Uh, to, 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 to. Okay. So, and the next thing I want you to do, I want you to actually extract everything that is not uh, the video format related to a separate module, so that module could be reused for different kinds of rendering. Right. So let's go ahead and do that. So. Um, did they have anything uh, stashed? I think I don't. So let's create sim rs and basically start moving everything that is not related to uh, to the video format, right? So everything related to the simulation, because we all live in a simulation, right? Uh, what do you guys think? Do you guys think we live in a simulation or we real live in a real world? <laughs> right? Apparently, it's a very popular topic. Uh, I don't know why, but. Uh, in, in my head, personally, this doesn't make any sense, but people like to talk whether we live in a simulation or not. So, mm, so this is orientation. Uh, do, 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 do. So here is the state. Uh, here is another state and uh, a boom. Eh. Uh, there we go. Mm. <clears throat> mm. I get so much anxiety about thinking stuff like that. Why? What's interesting is that people who are talking about like whether we live in a simulation on a real world, they never give the definition of what is a simulation and what is a real world. Right. So what is a simulation exactly? <laughs> so let's imagine like a maybe a game, right? So, um, I don't know, do we have a game? Uh, I think we do. So can I re build this game in 2021? Uh, so we have a piece of C code that I wrote almost a year ago, I think. It's a C++ code. Is it still compiling? Mm, let me see. I think it's still compiling. It's actually compiling both release and debug mode, but I'm not sure why. Mm. If I remember correctly, the simulation hypothesis was uh, already solved. Maybe some did not notice yet. But does it explain what people mean by simulation? Right? What do you mean by simulation? So, here we have a game, right? It's a, some sort of a simulation, right? It's a very simplified simulation. So, it, it does have a gravity. Right, something that behaves uh, as a gravity in our real world, whatever that's supposed to mean. Right, it's simulating the reality to some extent. Right, you, we can all agree that it's simulating the reality to some extent. Not, not fully, but the person living in that world doesn't really know uh, to what extent it is a simulation, right? So maybe it's perfectly fine for them. But here's the interesting thing. 
uh, the state of the whole simulation is represented as the state of the electrons in this small box sitting on my desk, right? So the state of the electrons and uh, semiconductors, like in everything, actually fully and completely corresponds one to one to what's going on like here on the screen. And basically this is a device that translates that state to something that my brain can understand. But electrons are part of what we call the real world. So the state of this game is part of what we call the real world. It is not really a simulation because this entire thing is part of the real world, whatever is that supposed to fucking mean, right? So we can all agree with that. If the electrons part of the real world, that means this game is part of the real world. It is as real as you and me. It's just like we have a device that translates the state of the game to something that our brain understands. And here's an interesting thing. People like to, uh, you know, ponder on a similar idea that there is like a real world and uh, the world of ideas. Ideas live in our head and everything outside is uh, a real world. Well, idea, if we understand, uh, if we correctly understand how brain works, is a biochemical process, right? So your idea represented by biochemistry in your brain and biochemistry, all of these substances that uh, react in your brain, they're also part of the real world. So they are part of the real world. So what is the distinction between simulation and real world? Everything that we call sort of simulation, ideas, not real, it's all part of the real world. It's just like worlds encoded differently. They're sort of encoded, but they're part of the same world. So there is no point in this demarcation between, between real and real. It's all one single world. It, there's no point in that. So this is how I personally see it. This is how a person is seeing, and that's why I don't understand the discussion. We are in a simulation or we are not. Well, it's kind of pointless. What is a simulation, <laughs> right? Even if I create something that I call simulation, it's still part of the real world. No matter how much I claim it's not, it is part of the real world. Um, so, <clears throat> you see what I mean? Um... So that, that's why for me, this kind of discussion doesn't make any sense because I don't see the difference between real world and a simulation. It's they're part of the same thing, right? Mm -mm. Mm, okay, so that's basically everything I wanted to say, <laughs> right? Um, mm. So I moved everything to a separate module and uh, now I think I'm going to go ahead and just put this module in here. I'm going to say that the module sim is part of this entire thing. Uh, mm -mm. That's also only one way to explain it. Explain what? What are we explaining? <laughs> Reduction of mind, whatever it is to biochemistry, is a hypothesis. We have not yet derived mind on paper. Um, simulation hypothesis. Simulation hypothesis. But I'm not talking about whether simulation hypothesis is true or not. I'm saying that I don't understand discussion around it because people not really uh, defining well enough what is simulation and what is reality. So that was my point. This is not what I'm talking about. Um, okay. My point is not whether it's true or not true or something. My point is that it's kind of pointless to discuss that, I think. So, yeah. <clears throat> so. Uh, let's continue. Hmm. So here's the orient, we have to actually do self. And basically I moved everything, right? And now I'm uh, moving everything to a separate module to actually make it compilable, right? So our goal is to make this entire thing compilable. Split, uh, reduce factor. Uh, I'm gonna be putting that in, actually I have two of these things opened. Two of these things opened and there we go. 
uh, rectangle velocity, right? Uh, rectangle velocity. Mm, so, uh, rect velocity. Okay, we're gonna move that in here. Uh, next one, uh, delta time. Okay, so I think delta time should be a parameter of the rectangle itself. I think I'm pretty sure about that. Hmm. Though interestingly enough, um, I think we can we could inline update into the state, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. So let's actually accept the delta time, right? So this is going to be f32, and there we go. So this will become the delta time like this. Okay. The next thing uh, is that width. Okay. So here is an interesting thing. We have two kind of width and height. So the width and height of the canvas and width and height of the simulation. So width and height of the canvas is basically how much how many pixels we have and width and height of the simulation is uh, essentially where are the boundaries and I think they may not necessarily match. So in our case they sort of matched accidentally but I don't think they have to. Um, so I think think width and height should be a parameter of uh, this entire thing. So we're going to accept the width uh, f32 and height uh, f32 as well. Mm, okay. So here's the width, uh, here's the height and uh, yeah, there we go. So rectangle width. Mm -hmm. So rectangle width and rectangle height is basically the initial width and height of the rectangle, right? So that means it's going to be a rectangle width and uh, I think I can actually move a lot of these things to the simulation, right? Because I can already see they're not belong to the main module, right? And uh, so the state new. Okay, so here is the thing. We need to import everything uh, from uh, the simulation, right? So there we go. Import everything from the simulation and uh, so struct uh, state, right? So this is going to be the public thing now. And I suppose we'll have to make all of this thing public, right? Uh, things like render, update, and so on and so forth. There we go. So what else do we have in here? Uh, fill rectangle uh, RGBA in the scope. So to be fair, what we're doing in here, in fact, we're just cleaning up the rectangle. So this thing is completely obsolete. Yeah. So it is not needed. Uh, I don't know why I keep it in here. Uh, so what else do we have in here? So update and update is going to have a particular delta time. Uh, so and where do we have a delta? Delta time is not found. Oh, shit. OK, so I think delta time is going to be something like this. So this is going to be delta time. Yeah, we will have to pass it. Uh, and here is the delta time. Uh, delta time, delta time, uh, update. This thing takes three arguments. So this is going to be width and height. And what I'm thinking is that I think we're going to pass the width and height from the state itself, right? So I think we have to do width f32 and height f32. Right, so it's going to be width and height. And we're going to accept this width and height from the constructor of the state. Right, so it's going to be width and height and something like this. So uh, there we go. And then let's actually recompile so I can get a fresh place. So this one is going to be width as f32, height as f32. Next one. Mm. Uh, so here is the self. So I suppose I'll have to set width and uh, height. Mm -hmm. Width and height. Uh, so and I'll have to do something like self width self height. Mm -hmm. So and this thing kind of found a very interesting uh, point. This function is never used anymore, so we can finally remove it. That's cool. Uh, all right, I think I extracted everything. So if we take a look at the diff, right, we basically removed a lot of stuff from the main module. And all of that was moved to a separate module, which is basically the simulation. And uh, in here, 
we don't even care about the video format. So this entire simulation thing could be used then for a real-time rendering, right? So, and we sort of abstracted away the platform code from the, from the state of the, of the simulation, which is quite convenient. And let's try to run the entire thing and see if it uh, works or not. So, uh, player and player. Uh, output, uh, this is not correct, so I actually need to do something like this. Okay, so everything seems to be working still. Mm. Kikumrat! Kikumrat! Opa! Da white boy! Suka bled! Any Russians in the chat? Hello! Maybe we should listen to some hugged boss. I think I want to make a small break, by the way. What's up, Sigma? Very good. Um, do, 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 do. So, okay, so we uh, factored out this simulation quite well. Uh, so, let me see. So the simulation was factored out. Uh, factor out the sim module, right? So now I'm gonna push that right into the repo and you can find the source code of the simulation module in here. Uh, you can find out the source code of the simulation uh, module in here. And I think I'm gonna make a small break, right? Uh, because I wanna make a cup of tea. And after a cup of tea, uh, we're gonna go ahead and try to start working on the, on the sound, right? We're gonna start working on the sound. So, um, um, all right. So today is a very unproductive stream. So because we still can't get into the sound programming, so let's try to at least generate some PCM files, I suppose. So I'm going to do the same uh, idea that I did in my uh, video a long time ago, basically making um, Haskell in music, uh, music in Haskell, right? Music in Haskell. Uh, so music in Haskell, making music in uh, like with Haskell from scratch, blah, blah, blah. Uh, not clickbait. Uh, so, and I'm going to give this thing to YouTube people in the description as well. Okay, uh, music uh, with Haskell uh, video, right? Old uh, music with Haskell video, there we go. Cool. Um, so how are we gonna be doing all of that? So I think I'm going to start maybe with a completely separate uh, module. Um, so let's actually call it something like sound.rs. Uh, and this is where we're going to be like experimenting with this entire thing, right? I don't quite remember how you generate a PCM format. Do you just uh, generate the the bytes and stuff like that? I think that's what you do. Mm. But essentially, uh, what we need to do, uh, we need to generate a bunch of like bytes, right? A bunch of bytes. Uh, so, which are usually called samples, right? Which are usually called samples, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, so each byte sort of represents a value from like minus n to plus n. Uh, integer or float, it actually depends on what you want to uh, have. So in that value can be something like this. And what you do with this value, you literally draw a sound wave with them like seriously you literally draw a sound wave uh, and so the amount of the samples is usually uh, I think 48 um, 48,000 of these things per second 
or there is another one 41 something something but you usually use 48 because it's just easy to remember right so and you have like 48 thousands of like numbers two byte or one byte or four bytes if you like doing floats or something like that and you literally just draw the wave with their value the sound wave and then you feed that into your sound system maybe the player or the sound card or something like that and it will start playing the sound wave so that's basically the idea it's 44 yeah 44 1 uh yeah so something like that i don't quite remember and hertz means uh usually hertz means basically times per second right so something it's not really hertz right because it's more of a samples per second right so essentially you take a second and you divide it by 44 100 right and that portion that small portion is one single number in here so it's a very high resolution right so it's a very high resolution um so and that's basically what we have to do right uh, so and i forgot what it's usually called the this hurts uh, this frequency i suppose it's called frequency or something like that uh yeah so the thing we're gonna do uh is we're gonna yeah sample frequency right uh so samp frequency right is going to be equal to 48000 right and i think it's going to be just u size right so this is going to be u size sample freak uh so the next thing i want to do maybe i'm going to just go ahead and generate a sine wave with like a one single second um Mm -mm -mm. so what kind of sound wave we're gonna be doing so first thing i probably need to do i probably need to open the file right so i need to do stdfs uh file and let's do file open uh output pcm mm. Mm. you also use wave well what's interesting is that with pcm you don't really have to use wave Right, because then you can just generate, you can dump raw uh, wave information and then play it with a play, uh, right? Play it with a play and just give it uh, the frequency and uh, basically the format, right? You can specify what's the format of that thing. So it's a 16 bit or a sine bit or floating, how many bits you have in there and what's the rate. And it will just play this thing raw. Uh, so. Right, so this one is going to be sync, right, and this one is going to be mutable. I also maybe uh, want to have buffer right. Uh, I keep forgetting where, where those things are located. Rust stdlib. There we go. Uh, Rust stdlib. Mm. Oh, this also supports raw PCM, but it seems nicer to encode that information in the file itself. Yeah, I suppose. Right, but for the uh, for the debug purposes, I guess it's fine. Right, if you want to just quickly debug something, so yeah. Uh, I don't know. So I treat PCM similarly to how I treat PPM. Not a really serious, serious format. It's just like a intermediate thing to dump debug information, right? So um, yeah, PCM is just basically wave without the header, right? So but wave it's a little bit more complicated than just uh, you know header slapped on top of PCM data. So there's more to that, I think. So it could get a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, so what I wanted to find, I wanted to find the buff writer, right? So let's actually find buff writer. So it's in studio. Mm -hmm. uh, buff writer. So what I want to do in here is, uh, I think it has to be create actually. Buff writer new, uh, right? And this thing is going to be something like that. Uh, so I also want to use stdio. So I'm gonna return IO result. Uh, right, nothing. So it, it really reminds me about Java. Uh, because in Java, when you write a simple program that just works with uh, standard IO, you constantly have to do something like throws IO exception at the end of each individual function. So it kind of, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of that. So it's kind of funny, I think. So uh, we can iterate through each individual sample, uh, right? So in zero sample freq. So and the question is, what's going to be like a single size of this thing, right? Single size. So we can probably use. Um, 
maybe float. What a play supports? A play. A play. So formats, does it support floating point? So it supports floating uh, least significant one or something. I remember that in Haskell, there was like super easy to encode uh, these kind of things because uh, you could just give it a float and say it's a least significant one or a little engine or big engine. It will just give you the bytes. Uh, I wonder if uh, Rust has something similar. So LE... Um, so bytes le or something let's actually find rust um, bytes of float transmitting bytes um, maybe there is a method in in float itself okay so there's a byte order something i don't want to install any third party dependencies so uh, let me see, maybe it's F32, right? So if it's F32, maybe I'm going to find something, something useful in there. To, oh, oh, here it is. Here it is. Here's the thing. Oh, and it, it straight up gives you this kind of shit. That's actually super convenient. Okay. That's pretty pog. So we can just, okay. Okay, so we, we, we can you probably use that. Um, the question is, so it's supposed to be, it's going to be, if it's a float, it will expect a value from minus one to one. Right, that's pretty pog. Um, okay, so I suppose what we're going to be doing here, we're going to be writing uh, something like a sign. Right, so let's let's find sign. Uh, let's find sign, it's F32. Computes the sign, where does it accept self? All right, so it accepts self. Uh, returns a new number that does not mutate the original value. Uh, so I suppose what we need to do in here, right? So this is the sample and this is like a samples per second. So that means I can have a time by dividing as by the sample frequency, right? So, but I have to do that in, uh, in as F32, right? As F32. So here's the time. And then I can take that time, take a sign of that time, right? And uh, two le bytes right two le bytes or something like that and take a reference to that and it will write that thing in there right so that's pretty um, lucrous <laughs> the boy what is it is it really the boy it's the fuck wait two le boy Okay, that's that's a good one. Uh, so, uh, all right, uh, let me see. So it's gonna be sign le bytes uh, and oh, oh, oh. Uh, I think we're ready to can stop. Uh, all right, so let's, let's try to compile the entire thing. Uh, this one is gonna be a sound. I also want to indicate that um, we wrote this kind of thing. So it's gonna print ln uh, generated this output path right and output pcm is going to be output path and here we're going to have output path uh, which is a string of course and a boom a boom and now i can do sound rs okay so we forgot to do that um uh, right, so it didn't have a right um, method uh, not found so i suppose we'll have to also import Right, like this. Is that what you want from me? Is that what you want? Yeah, so yes, so yes, so cowboy freaking desu. Okay, uh, okay, go. Okay, seems to be working, seems to be twerking. So, and if I round the sound, it generated output PCM, and we have a PCM, right? We do have, in fact, a PCM. So, what's interesting is that I have no idea what kind of sound it will generate. Um, whether it's going to be loud or whether it's not going to be loud so it's kind of dangerous to do this kind of shit on the stream and also it oscillates from minus uh, minus one to one right it's minus one to one so the thing i want to do here maybe i'm going to actually uh take this entire thing and multiply it by half like reduce it to not really half but let's actually say quarter right so i think quarter is going to be fine um so i might control maybe this thing as a volume right so it's going to be f32 uh volume and let's actually put it in here so it's going to be volume 
There we go. Okay. So, and let's try to play this entire thing. So, uh, I'm going to do A play. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, let's actually open A play. A play. Apply. Oh my god, why am I. I'm, I'm getting tired. Uh, A play. So, uh, maybe. Uh, we need to have some sort of a shell script, right? Where we're gonna do all of that. Uh, so I'm going to basically run Rust C uh, sound dot rs. Then I'm gonna do sound. Uh, also, I want to actually enable it. So uh, xe is it xe is or ex? I think it's xe. I think it, the order doesn't matter, right? I think the order doesn't matter and uh where is the where is the okay here is the, here's the thing six yes it says six it's like seconds right uh a play the format and uh the other thing is going to be floating point uh so floating point le right so the format is floating point le and the rate is going to be uh, I suppose uh, 48000. So that's basically what we have. And then we're going to use uh, output PCM. All right. So then I'm going to make this entire thing uh, executable. And we are about to run the shit and hear something for the first time. Are you guys ready? Are you guys ready? So uh, take off your headphones because I don't know what's going to be, uh, what's going to happen. Did you hear anything? I didn't really hear anything because I didn't have my headphones on. What is, was it too loud? Uh, okay, so we didn't hear anything. I'm gonna try to listen to something now. Okay, so I heard like a... I think it was too loud. I think it was... and too low, not too loud, but too low. Uh, so one of the things we can try to do maybe is to increase the frequency. All right. To increase the frequency, we can just multiply the entire value by uh, two, right? So let's actually have like twice of the frequency. Uh, then we'll have to come up with a way to know precisely the frequency that we're doing, right? So we need to know precisely the frequency. Um, okay. Uh, Floppy Lil Indian. So I can't hear shit in this mist. So let's actually do something like this. Uh, all right. What if we have a little bit longer duration, right? What if we have a little bit longer duration? So maybe I'm gonna do something like duration, but duration is gonna be in the seconds, right? So let's say that I wanna listen for at least three seconds. So that means I'm gonna take the sample rate and I'm gonna multiply it by duration, right? And then I'm gonna floor it and take it as you size, right? So that's the amount of samples, right? So this is gonna be basically sample count, uh, sample count. It's kind of similar to generating frames, honestly, uh, right? So it's gonna be sample count, All right, sample count. Uh, now I can control this kind of stuff. So maybe I'm gonna actually uh, have a higher volume, uh, right? And so right now I'm not trying to be precise about the frequency, right? So I just wanna manage to generate something that sounds like a sine wave. Uh, right, duration uh, is F32, uh, okay, so F32, there we go. Okay, I can't hear, but there is a click at the end. Right, so I'm gonna just assume that we need a higher frequency. So I'm gonna actually go magnitudes higher. Oh shit. Hard bass, hard bass. Opa, that way, that way. Uh, one more time. That's a pretty good bass. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, all right, so let's actually try to generate more. Uh, okay, so, so maybe I'm gonna actually reduce the volume a little bit. I think like 25 because it's too freaking much. Yeah, I think it's a little bit better. Uh, okay, so let's call it like a frequency um, uh, factor, right? So this is going to be a frequency factor. Uh, frick factor. Uh, and uh, it's going to be F32. And this is something like this. It's not the precise frequency. Uh, but yeah, so this is a more of a sample rate, right? So we already established that it's not a frequency, it's a sample rate. Let's rename it to sample rate. 
right there we go so now we have a sample rate and uh now let's try to actually make it even higher right okay that, that sounds good uh so what about like six and uh maybe thousand mm -hmm. so we're starting to get somewhere two thousand uh That already sounds like something, isn't it? Doesn't it? So we can go higher. So that's basically the the frequency we're talking about. So every time I say something offensive on the stream, it's just like, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, now we can generate uh, like different sounds and shit. And uh, I think we need to be able to generate shit with a very precise uh, frequency. Does that sound like a sandstorm? <laughs> I really okay so if you're interested uh if you're interested in the thing that i'm doing right now right and you're also interested in haskell i really recommend you to watch my video i actually made a video about the things that i'm doing right now right so check out this video but apparently a lot of people already watched that video but yeah that's basically what i did back you know, back in the days uh when i was uh, mentally sane uh yeah <clears throat> Anyways, so we need to generate precise frequency. So um, let me see. So what's the usual uh, A-ton frequency? Um, was it A-ton? Uh, maybe we want to actually find A-ton sign. Uh, yeah. So it's 440 hertz. Uh, okay, let's just listen to that then. Hopefully it's not going to be too loud. I have no time to adjust the volume. Yeah. So let's try to generate this sine wave. 440. Right. 10 hours, why? I don't know, for, for ad revenue, probably. <laughs> Look at the amount of views. Holy shit. The <laughs> you just make you just generate 10 hours of that and uh, yeah you're gonna have a lot of views mm -hmm. when you're better tuning your guitar yeah exactly that's the reason why would you would you have this kind of stuff uh okay so what is the frequency right so if i remember correctly i explain it as frequency is the amount of times per second right amount of times per second and in case of a sine wave right in case of a sine wave um what we usually have a single sort of cycle of a sine wave looks like this right so uh yeah we go from here to here and the distance between these things is effectively 2 pi right because this entire thing is basically unrolled circle right it's sort of like unrolled circle. Uh, this one is basically 2 pi. Right, and we basically need to um, control how many of these things we have per second, right? And my brain uh, cannot uh, comprehend how to do that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm. So essentially, no, it's not actually really true, isn't it? No, no, it's not 2pi. Or is it 2pi? Yeah, it is. It is 2pi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'll have to recover. Maybe I need, I'll need to watch that video at some point. But before I go and watch that video, uh, I think I want to make a small break because my brain is shutting down for some reason. I don't know why. Because again, I'm streaming for more than like two hours and it's just like too difficult for me. So uh, let's make a small break. Okay. So uh, yeah, it's going to be five minutes. All right, so and after that, maybe we're gonna watch that video because I do ex did explain that uh, how that works in that video, but I obviously I already forgot everything. 
right let's make a small break and you guys have fun uh and of course i need to uh pause the recording um all right so uh let's take a look at this entire thing one more time so essentially yeah so this is uh y right this is y and this one is x so what's interesting is that this is essentially one and this is minus one so it goes from minus one to one and i was initially right i think um so to do the full cycle right so you can basically say that it's a two pi uh right so it's a two pi like this so we have a single cycle in here uh so how can we do all of that so if you want to have like more than two cycles per second right more than two cycles per second you'd have to uh yeah you basically have to multiply it by the frequency right you just have to multiply it by frequency uh but then you i suppose you have to offset it by the current time right so you have to offset it by the current time and uh i'm not quite sure i'm not quite sure mm -mm -mm -mm. I guess you also multiply by time. So my hypothesis, right, so it's kind of difficult for my brain to comprehend it right now, but I think uh, you take the time, uh, you multiply it by two pi, uh, and also by the frequency that you want to have. And the, uh, the target frequency, right, that we have in here is 440. Uh, 540 and we also multiply this entire thing by time how much time has passed right so i suppose that's the thing we can do in here but the, the question is like what is the pi in rust um so if, if it's not correct i'll probably will just go and um watch the video yet again because i don't remember <laughs> f32 uh f32 const uh pi there we go let's try to compile the entire thing and hopefully that will not blow up our ears. So get ready, chat. Uh, it does not compile them. Uh, F32, ambiguous associated type. Uh, so STD, or do I what do I have to do? Uh, yeah, they're looking for module STD, yeah, yeah. So, so this is the zero or something. I think we did it. So if I take a look at the sine wave in here, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's the that's the sound. Uh, yeah, I think we did it. So it was actually relatively easy. Uh, the volume is actually kind of high for some reason. I'm not sure why. So if I make like make it ten, will it um, will it be a little bit less uh, harsh? Okay, so that looks a little bit better. Uh, okay, so we now can generate different frequencies and shit. Uh, that's pretty pog. That's pretty pog. Not gonna lie um and so the other thing i want to do is um i guess that's pretty much it uh i want to now integrate this sound generator with the video generator right so i want to uh, integrate it with the video generator and the question is how we're going to be doing all of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't want to go ahead and generate a uh, sound for this mess, right? So I want you to actually generate sound for each individual collision in here, uh, but I think it's too much. So what I want to try to do now, I want to try to have a different simulation that just plays a single rectangle, right? So, and every time that rectangle collides with something, we're going to play the sound like a beep of a tone, right? So, so that's one of the things we can try to do in here. I'm going to go back in here and maybe even go into the simulation, right? Uh, let's go into the simulation. And in the simulation, I want to uh, make like a single rectangle that continuously like bounces around. Uh, so here we have a split and... Yeah, every time we encounter a sp like a split, right? We're just calling rectangle split. But I what what I want to do instead, what I want to do instead is command out this entire thing and have a separate function, uh, something like rect 
bounce, right? Erect bounce, which takes the orientation. Oh, by the way, we're down. We're straight up down, uh, and I'm not sure if we're gonna reconnect at some point. Oh, we reconnected, okay. So since I'm also recording locally, so it's not that bad. Uh, hello again, by the way. So on the YouTube, you will be able to see everything. So it was like a quick F. So it was a quick F. So, and uh, in here, what we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be doing self rect and we're just gonna push the rectangle back, right? So essentially, I'm creating a separate mode uh, in which um, creating separate mode in which we are uh, only bouncing off this entire thing, right? Uh, only bouncing off. Okay, so we don't have a bounce. Uh, so let's go ahead and implement the bounce. Uh, so fn bounce self, and it's also going to take orient, uh, right? And it's going to return a new rectangle, right? Mm -mm -mm -mm. So it is consuming itself. Interestingly enough, uh, I think I can even uh, optimize that a little bit. So if the orientation is vertical, right? If the orientation is vertical, I can take the self and I can multiply its y, dy rather, by minus one, uh, right? And then just return self. So that's basically what I want to do in here. Uh, if we have a horizontal one, uh, we do the same thing. Maybe I can even like, you know, uh, put them together. And since it's just a single thing, I can even do something like that. And we need to do that. Self dx dx uh, minus one. So that's basically how we're going to be bouncing off in here. Uh, is it compiling? It is not really compiling because, uh, oh, it's an integer. So we have to really multiply it by, by a floating point. So, uh, use self orientation of our nation. And what do we have in here? Uh, this one is not mutable. Can I just make it as mutable like this? Is that a thing I could, apparently it is a thing that I can do. That's actually super cool. Uh, why is it so slow though? I, I think I know. Uh, okay. So I think I'm going to go to run sh and just do C opt level, uh, three. There we go. So I hopefully it will be a little bit faster now. Okay, so we're generating a thing that just bounces off of the uh, edges, right? That's basically what we have in here. That's the mode we have. That's the mode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Generated Oracle Y for M. Okay, so it's still going because it's like flushing the output and stuff like that, right? It is flush in the output and we're ready. So let's take a look at the final result. Uh, y for M. So there we go. So now we have just a single rectangle that bouncing off. Right, that's pretty cool. So, and every time it's bouncing off, I want to output some sort of a sound, like a beep, right? For uh, like a certain amount of seconds. So this is a 16 seconds, as you can see, right? Uh, and how are we gonna be generating the beep? That's a good question. So every time we're doing the update, right, we're rendering ourselves into a canvas, right? And maybe we need to create yet another method that outputs the sound, right? And it's going to accept, well, we kind of know the delta time, right? We kind of know the delta time. Mm, so this one is rather interesting. So which one is going to be better? Which one is going to be better? So that means the state itself also have to keep track of how much time has passed and whatnot, uh, which is not particularly natural. And also sound has to be played within this entire thing. All right. So, uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So we need to accept the sound buffer, right? So this is going to be sound and it's going to be accepting the buffer of F32 uh, samples, right? So that's the samples. Uh, and maybe we can also accept the frequency, right? So we accept the frequency, sound uh, frequency in uh, samples. Right, sound frequency and samples. So, and how much the size of this buffer is determined by delta time? It is in fact determined by delta time. Right. Um, 
But the question is, so to find the size of this, well, I mean, you do know the size of the uh, the buffer, like you just you just straight up know it. So there's no reason for uh, like to worry about this kind of stuff. Um, mm, 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 mm. Okay, so I suppose now uh, we should be able to output the sound. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep track uh, of when we're playing the sound, right? So we need some sort of a variable uh, that says for how long we need to play the sound, right? And initially it's going to be zero, of course. Uh, so let's, let me actually set it to something like a, um, mm, a zero. Right. It's going to basically keep track of the time, right? It's basically keeping track of the time. And um, if A uh, is less than zero, right? If it's less than zero, we need to output, uh, we need to output this kind of shit. Um, uh, so uh, basically, if it's greater than zero, right? If it's greater than zero, we'll have to output certain amount of stuff, right? Mm. So where is my buffer? Where is my buffer? So here is the buffer, right? And the buffer has a certain length, if you know what I'm talking about, right? It has a certain length. The thing that bothers me a lot is that uh, delta time determines the size of the buffer but it's also floating point which means that it's kind of difficult to precisely correlate the size of the sound buffer and the delta time so i don't know maybe delta time is going to be the time of the simulation of, uh, of the simulation itself and the size of the sound buffer is going to be delta time for the sound that would make more sense i think so it's kind of yeah it's kind of difficult to work with but just it is what it is it just is what it is um yeah and okay so if there is any sort of like a bouncing off in here we'll have to set self a to the um, um to the beep duration right so we're gonna have something like beep duration and for how long uh, the beep is gonna play right beep duration is gonna be f32 and i remember that uh, like 200 milliseconds was kind of fine right it was in fact kind of fine so uh all right so this is the duration mm. and what's funny is that there's two situations in here when a is smaller then uh, the size of the buffer, right? Uh, the size of the buffer, and we need to know that like that's this specific delta, delta t or something. So that is very annoying. Right. So okay, we we may, we may use delta time. So if this thing is less than delta time, right? Uh, so that means we need to partially output that. And another situation is when A is bigger than delta time. Maybe like maybe equal. Uh, or maybe equal can be here. Right. Equal. So if it's greater than or equal to that, that means we just fill the, uh, fill the whole buffer. We fill the whole buffer with this thing. Mm -mm. I fill the whole buffer with this thing. Ah. Uh. So, and what's funny is that we also need to keep track of the global time, uh, otherwise we won't be able to even output the sign. Okay, so let's introduce something like a global time, right, F32. Uh, this is a really hard problem, by the way, like, uh, I think I never done anything like that. So that's why I'm struggling a little bit, but I think I know conceptually how to do this kind of thing. So I think I conceptually will be able to do that. Uh, all right. So we do this kind of thing. And then after we process everything, I'm going to take the global time, right? And I'm going to add delta time, like on each frame, we're adding the delta time. Uh, okay. So now i probably want to find the, the minimum and maximum between the uh these things uh min uh what is the uh, i think yeah so there's f32 min i can probably use that thing uh 
Oh, it's also that, that's a really nasty thing. Okay. So A and uh, I want to find the minimum between these things. So it's going to be delta time. All right. So that gives us for how long we want to fill the buffer, right? So this is the amount of seconds. And since frequency is the amount, amount of samples per second, right? We want to multiply this thing like that as F32, uh, right? So, and that gives us uh, the amount of samples that we want to fill. And I'm going to always surround down to avoid buffer overflows. And here we have uh, the sample count, right? So here is the sample count. There we go. This is the sample count. So then I'm going to be iterating through each individual sample in here. Maybe it's going to be N0 sample count. Right, there we go. Um, and ooh, what's the delta between those things? Okay, so sound I equal to Mm. We need a beep frequency, a beep frequency F32, and we know that it's this thing, right? So it's it's that stuff. So and as you can see, we also have uh, in the original sound thingy, we also had time. But here we'll have to compute time slightly differently. So time is going to be i multiplied by sample step, right? Something called sample step. And a sample step is essentially uh, like a one over the sound frequency, right? Sound frequency uh, as of 32, right? So this is a single sort of like a sample step, uh, right? And that's effectively what we're doing. So this is our t. So, and within that T, we're uh, taking two STDF32, I'm gonna just call it pi, uh, because I can then import it uh, quite easily. So, and I multiply by the beep frequency, uh, beep frequency, and multiply by this thing. Uh, then I take the sign of this entire stuff, right, and multiply that by beep volume, right, I multiply that by beep volume. Uh, and I think that is it. So after that, I should be able to update that global time. Uh, also, every time we update this stuff, I might as well subtract that um, sample step from A. Uh, sample step from A, but I'm not sure if it makes sense. I think I'm gonna just do it like this, I minus uh, data time, yeah. Oh, there we go. So that's the easiest way to do that. Okay, so A is basically the duration of the currently playing beep, right? So for how long? It's like a cooldown for it. Uh, so this is the count uh, for the sound frequency, then sound step. And we're stepping through all of that. So we're updating, we are outputting all of that. And uh, I think that should be fine. Let's actually go through uh, compilation errors. Uh, right, so this is, oh, this has to be self A, okay, so that's, uh, now I have to go through this entire stuff and just like do it like that, okay. So here I want to probably import, um, to be fair, I'm using it in a single place, so I, at, at the beginning I didn't want to do that, but I mean, I can just do that, it doesn't matter, consts, uh, it's going to be pi, and uh, what else do we have in here, beep volume, okay, so let's actually define beep volume, so the beep volume is going to be uh, around, 10, right, so we don't want to make it too loud, right, so we don't want to make it too loud. The, the other one, so it's a self A, uh, another one. Uh, okay, so now we're starting to have something very interesting. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So this is more of a like a platform code that creates everything for the simulation. And uh, it creates a canvas and creates a sync and stuff like that. So what's interesting is that it also needs to create a sound buffer, right? It needs to create a sound buffer into which the simulation can output the sound, right? So uh, here we're probably gonna define things like um, sound uh, sample rate, right? So we're gonna have a sound sample rate, which as I already mentioned is going to be use size 48,000, uh, right? So this is gonna be sample rate. 
So what's going to be the uh, size of this uh, um, of the sound buffer? Well, the size of the sound buffer is going to be equal to the length of the single frame, right? So basically, your simulation outputs a frame to the canvas and also a sound for that single frame. Also the sound for that single frame. So that's what we're going to be doing in here. Uh, so here's the canvas and what I need to do in here, I need to uh, create a sound. It's going to be a vector, right? So it's easier to actually put that on the on a heap so we don't overflow the stack. So in the size of this entire thing is going to be delta time, right? We're taking the delta time and we multiply that by the frequency uh, um, sound sample rate right sound sample rate as far as i know delta time is f32 uh, we take it as uh, f32 we multiply them together and it gives us the amount of samples and to avoid uh, any sort of like overflows we're gonna always like oh you know what i'm gonna actually seal it right you know in the simulation we floor that value right yeah we basically floor this entire value all the time uh, but in uh, the actual platform, we're gonna seal it, so we have the, this additional, uh, this additional place. Not sure if it's worth sealing it like that. It would be better if it was a little bit consistent. So because of the floating point rounding, it's gonna be like kind of wonky. So maybe there will be like uh, weird orphan samples or something like that so but uh, we can fix that a little bit later so uh, first let's actually have something working and then we can discuss how to make this entire thing more robust if you know what I'm talking about right okay so here is a sample buffer and uh, let's see what we have in here so this is the delta time expected use size okay so then I can convert it to use size um, okay so what do we have in here so when, I, when I'm updating simulation expects what it expects the sound. Uh, oh, and by the way, sound has to be mutable, of course. It has to be mutable. And sound frequency, it's its not a frequency, it's a sample rate. Uh, sample. Why did I call it frequency? I'm gonna do the thing. Sound uh, sample rate. There we go. So that's basically what we're doing in here. Uh, and uh, what do we have? I'm gonna go ahead and quickly replace sound frequency, sound sample rate. Boom, boom. Uh, what else do we have in here? And so uh slice f32 found vector it's a vector integer something 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 can i say f32 like this uh oh well i mean if i do it like that i think it will have enough information to actually derive all of the information okay so sample step is that so i have to convert it to f32 uh do we have anything else everything's okay so it started to generate shit but here's the interesting thing even though it's generating sounds right everything's fine is generating sounds we're not saving those sounds to uh to a file so the platform layer so to speak has to also open the uh audio sync so this thing is going to be video sync uh where it outputs the video and we also need to open something like audio sync uh where it's going to be uh outputting the audio right and it's also going to be buffered uh buff writer uh file uh create um uh, audio output path and this one is going to be video output path like this right so uh, that's basically what we're going to be doing in here so uh, path so this is the video output path and the audio output path is going to be PCM there we go so we're outputting the raw video and raw audio which we can then merge uh, with a tap and back or something right so here's the video uh, sync, right? So that's the video sync, and this is the video sync as well. Uh, do we have anything else? Um, the video uh, output path and also audio output path. Okay, everything seems to be compiled. Now, um, we save the frame, right? We save the frame, and on top of that, uh, what we're gonna be doing uh, we're gonna be saving the sound as well. You know what I'm thinking? You know what I'm thinking? Uh, before playing the sound, before playing the sound, we're gonna take this sound thing and fill it with zero. So we're gonna clean up the buffer first and only then give it to the state to play the sound into that buffer. Right, and after it plays this thing, we're gonna say uh, audio sync, audio sync, write those things into here oh my god this one is actually oh shit uh, 
fucker. I wonder if we can just write a sequence of things that are convertible to... Oh, it's probably not gonna work. Shit. That's actually truly sad. Mm. Mm. <laughs> because I need to convert them to four byte things and... Ah, shit. So it's not particularly, particularly great. So we'll need to think about how to do that easily. Could you explain the scene and the pie? Is that the scene oscillator? Uh, scene is a basically sine function, right? So it just generates the sine wave that we use for generating the sound. So that's basically what it does. And pi is closely related to sine. So essentially, if you uh, have some sort of x, right? If you have some sort of x, which is from the range from 0 to, to pi, right? So we, we can probably do something like this, right? So it's... Uh, 0 less or equal x less or equal to pi uh, this is not how you do pi and if you have sine of x right sine of x uh, this thing will basically do a single cycle right so if you traverse from 0 to 2 pi sine wave will just do one single cycle and what we're trying to do here we're trying to do 440 of them per second right to generate the a tone so the, the A note tone. So that's basically what we're doing here. Um, why four bytes? Because that's the format of the uh, output. Uh, because usually if you choose the format of F32 bit, that's the format that we chose, right? Uh, yeah, float LE, float is 32 bits. So 32 bits is four bytes. Okay, so uh, let me let me see. So I need to convert this entire thing to. I'm gonna just try to compile this entire thing. Maybe it's compilable. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, God damn it. I can try to map this thing, but that will mean that uh, I'll have to be generating. And maybe since this entire thing is buffered. Right, so since this entire thing is buffered, I can do something like sample in uh, sound, right? I can just iterate this entire thing and just write a sample to the bytes, to the bytes. And that's gonna be fine, I suppose. That's one of the things we can do. Uh, Zaki08, thank you so much for five months of Twitch Prime subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so that's one of the things we can do. And uh, maybe that will even compile, let's see. So, uh, borrow of move the sound. How the fuck did you move it? <laughs> where did you move it? Okay, let's take a look at where it was moved. Uh, it was moved... Ah, I see. So, let's actually iterate this entire thing by, by that stuff. Mm, okay, so it seems to be working. Okay, so it generates relatively fast, but I don't want to generate the whole video because the duration is 16 seconds. Okay, let's generate like three seconds of the video, right? So, and see how it goes. Okay, so it's gonna be a little bit faster, just a little bit. So it generated uh, Y4M and PCM, right? It generated both of them. So uh, we can take a look at the video that got generated. Um, so output Y4M. So that's the video that got generated, okay. So how many, uh, you know, collisions there was? So, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, it, 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 I think it has six, right? So I think there was no seven in there, right? So, uh, so there was six of them, and now we can try to listen uh, to the uh, to the audio. So the audio should also contain uh, six beeps in there, right? So let's go ahead and do that. 
So get ready, be super careful with your ears because I don't know if I made any mistake during this sound generation, so let's go. Well, it played something. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I think there is a bug in how we generate the sound, but at least it generated like the correct amount of those beats. So, and okay, so let's try to maybe merge those videos together and see if they will be played in a you know in correct uh, timing. So, I think um, I don't remember how we do that. So, uh, let's do FFmpeg FFmpeg merge video and audio, right? Merge video, how to merge uh, audio and video file in FFmpeg. Uh, so, input oh, you have this. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's actually pretty straightforward. I think I understand that. So you're going to have two inputs. So output Y for M, then the input output uh, PCM. Oh, for the PCM, fuck. Um, for PCM, you will need to convert it to some... Uh, like... Uh, God damn it. Uh, two, 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 two. So how are we going to do, be doing that for PCM? For PCM, so FFmpeg, all right, so just a second, I have some problems in here. FFmpeg, uh, PCM to wave. Uh, how to convert uh, PCM to wave? So you can, okay, so we can specify the format. All right, you can specify the format. Uh, well, I mean, this is not the particular right answer. So the format is that, but then the rate and so on and so forth. Uh, signed a little Indian samples. Okay, so I think we can work with that. I think we can work with that. So here's the audio. Uh, so I suppose I can say F32L, hopefully, if I understand the format convention correctly. Uh, and audio rate is uh, 480k if I, of course I understand the convention correctly um, and maybe I have to even do that in a particular order because who knows right input is going to be output PCM uh, and uh, yeah uh, so there's a copy so I want to copy the video right so I'm copying the video and the audio is going to be AAC uh, and I need to map this kind of stuff. So do I really need mapping? Um, since the audio stream is, for example, longer than the video stream, you have to cut it. Otherwise, uh, you'll have the last video frame still image. Oh, that don't care. Uh, OK, so yeah, so there is some sort of a mapping uh going on and maybe that's precisely what i want to do in here let's see if it's going to do something okay uh, at least one output file must be specified okay so i can say that the output is going to be output mp4 uh override this entire thing and conversion file okay could not find tag for codec raw audio and some codec currently um supported in container so we cannot just like apparently we cannot just take pcm um this thing mm, for maybe we should first convert the the file to that format i think that's what we probably first have to do uh, okay so let's actually do that inside of the script because that, that's a lot of complexity that you have to manage unfortunately uh okay so uh where was the conversion thing where was the conversion so this is going to be the conversion we're going to try to convert that uh like this and then maybe figure out how to do that uh without all that stuff f32 l uh 48k uh, i'm not sure why do you need this thing so what is ac uh two channels stereo um uh, Okay, so maybe that makes sense, sure. Uh, output PCM and this is going to be output wave. All right, so let's actually try to run the entire thing, right, and see if it if it is doing things. So we're generating both of these videos and audios, right, both of the videos and audios. And it converted the audio. Okay, so that's cool. And I can just try to play uh, the wave file, uh, so be careful. It was too fast, actually. That's really strange. Um, I think it was really, really fast. Like, what the fuck? Uh, 
And if I take a look at the output PCM, well, I mean, a play. A play. Uh, right. Why the fuck is it so fast? This is, this doesn't make any sense. Why the fuck would it be so fast? Um, because I'm, I converted all of that in a very specific uh, sample rate and it just like doesn't do that properly. That's really strange. Uh, well, yeah, over, over, oh my God, I cannot overwrite it. So this is gonna be something like that. And let me see, let me see. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I think somebody's doing fucky wacky, <laughs> seriously, because I'm generating everything in 48k uh, samples and it doesn't convert in 48 frames, uh, like uh, samples. It's, it's really, really weird. Um, okay, so maybe it has something to do with this thing. I'm not fucking sure. That is really, really weird. Mm. Mm. That is, in fact, really, very weird. Okay, 48 LE. All right, little engine. Uh, maybe I need to make another small break, chat. I think, yeah, I think I need to make another small break because uh, I'm getting a little bit overwhelmed. So, yeah. Um, all right, let's try to understand what the fuck is going on. Okay. So, um, uh, two channels. There's something sus with the channels. I'm not sure because everything else is fine. Uh, I think we should try to do that without the channels, with a, with a single channel. Let's give it a try. Um. Oh! Oh, yeah, I just remembered. So, the two channel basically is interleaved. And sh okay, so that makes sense. Okay. Alright, so we're done with this kind of shit. Uh, now... Uh, let's try to uh, to basically merge them together. Let's try to merge them together. So, uh, how to merge these two things? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be that, and uh, the input is going to be output uh, Y for M, and another input is going to be output wave and for the video we're copying this entire thing for the audio we're doing acc i'm not sure if that's important and then we're doing that thing okay so let's actually uh, give it a try all right so and see if it's gonna do the thing i just realized that i did a fucky wacky and probably oopsie doopsie so in both of the cases i want to specify why just to like ensure that it's gonna it's gonna do the thing uh, all right so what do we got Mm, 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 mm. And uh, wave, it's not wave. <laughs> okay, one more time. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so we generated two files together. And uh, could not find tag for codec row. Uh, codec not currently supported in the container, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I'm not even sure. So do we really need to like do anything about that. So do I have to specify this weird codex? Uh, I feel like I don't have to do that because like, why? I don't care, just pick something. Um, okay, go ahead and do that. Alrighty, it's doing the thing. It did the thing. Okay, so if I take a look at the output MP4. There there we go. So we have a sound plane when we hit things. Granted, the sound is completely corrupted, but uh, it's a separate bug that we can address a little bit later. Right, it's a separate bug that we can address later. So the question is, can we now merge these two things together uh, somehow? So uh, basically, can I just do uh, input PCM? But then also this kind of thing, because I don't know why it didn't work, but I'm also Pepega. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna try to do it like that. Uh, also, maybe it would be easier for me to split all of that into separate lines, but I'm not sure. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, input is video, the, uh, then the information about the output stuff, then we're mapping things together, and then we're doing that. Okay, so let's see if it's, it will process that properly. So because two FFmpeg commands is kind of pepega, so it should be possible to do it with one. Uh, and okay, it is possible to do that with one. That's actually pretty nice. All right, so uh, what about MP4 and... Okay, so uh, now I'm going to remove this kind of thing and uh, there we go. Uh, so let's continue. Let's try to understand what the fuck is wrong with the, uh, with the audio. Mm. And why it is like that? Oh yeah, I forgot to update the frequency. Uh, okay. Mm. So maybe I should automatically play the video when it's finished. I think that sounds like a good idea. Mm. Uh, chat, kindly, could you please tune down your back sitting a little bit? You're making me overwhelmed, please. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Just tune it down a little bit. Okay. Just a slightly bit. Like, uh, when people start back sitting me, I'm starting to have, like, a panic attacks. Uh, all right. So, uh, granted, I don't read the chat right now, so maybe it doesn't matter. Um, so, okay. Mm. So we need to understand what the fuck is wrong in here. I feel like this is because we don't compute the uh, thing correctly, right? Uh, right, so let me think more about that. Let me think more about that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so the frame rate okay so here's the video duration uh so the delta time uh and sound sample rate this is basically how many samples we have per uh per delta time right then we floor this entire thing and then we just generate this kind of a buffer right this kind of a buffer <clears throat> And buffer has a very specific size, uh, right? And then effectively what we do, we just dump this entire thing. Simply dump this entire thing. Okay, so now uh, I can see. So sample rate, uh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So this is the time. Uh, and I basically try to find the minimum between uh, the A and delta time, and then, um, well, that one is rather interesting. Um, people just don't listen to me, that's, that's insane. So this is how many samples you want to have. Right. So I'm streaming for how long? For three hours, uh, right. For three hours and I'm insanely tired and people just started to go crazy with back sitting, especially mark a death and that overwhelmed me to no end. And I don't want to ban people. <sighs> Okay, so I think I want to make another uh, another uh, cup of tea. Um, all right, 
Let's continue. I think I figured out what's the problem, is that I'm actually starting the time uh, from, I suppose, zero. And I actually wanted to use global time to actually start the sound from the global time, but then I forgot about that. Actually, I have to put the time somewhere in here, like this, right? So, yeah. Mm, so this is the global time, this is the time stamp, and um, I'm not even sure. Yeah, yeah so I, th I think that's precisely what I want to do in here. So it's a global time plus this thing. And maybe I can even update the global time like that. But yeah, global time is actually uh, more than just this. Right, so uh, let, me, let me do this kind of thing. And see if it's going to produce the good sound. Uh, so I thought specifically about this problem, right? I thought specifically that I need... Perfect. So I thought specifically about this problem and uh, I created global time exactly for that. But of course I forgot because I got overwhelmed by backsitting, right? So it is really, uh, really distracting to the point that you forget important things and cannot code properly. So people who backsit, they think that they're helping. In reality, they are distracting and ruining my mental model and I start forgetting things and I start to introduce bugs. So in reality, they're doing the opposite. Uh, they're actually, you know, the opposite of helping. I don't know if we have like an English word for opposite of helping, uh, right? But that's exactly what the backseater is doing. Uh, so, okay. Mm, let me, let me see. Uh, okay, cool. So there's still a little bit of clipping and this is because the uh, sound wave, I think, it's just like basically abruptly stops right it abruptly stops and maybe one of the things we can do with that thing is actually you know um you know increase and decrease the volume on the edges of these things um and i wonder how easy or difficult it is going to be um so uh yeah l let me actually listen to the output the final output one more time uh and oh my god uh, we'll see you're so annoying oh my god these UI applications are so goddamn annoying. You made a small mistake and it's gonna annoy you with shed of pop-ups telling me that you made a mistake. I made a mistake, shut the fuck up. Okay, I'm gonna use a play M player. <laughs> okay, one thing I wanna try to do is actually make the beep a little bit longer just to see if we have any like significant bugs in there right so l let me see uh okay we're gonna be using that maybe i'm in a in a run yeah i'm, I'm using already in player in the run um okay um mm -hmm. so we have a conversion this is pretty smooth this is a pretty smooth sine wave. So they basically merged together. And yeah, that was actually kind of good. So uh, I guess we don't have any bugs in the sine wave itself, right? So at least I don't hear anything. I have a pretty good headphones, actually. Um, well, granted, there is a music playing right now. So I'm going to actually pause the music. I don't hear any bugs and uh, I have like a monitor headphones. So, uh, yep. So let's actually go back uh, to here and uh, we're gonna say the duration is gonna be like a two, two of these things. Mm -mm. Um, Maybe it could be actually even shorter. I kind of want it to be shorter because they uh, somehow blend together. Um. Mm -mm. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so, how are we gonna be um, doing the smoothing out of this stuff? Uh, so we don't have any clippage. Um, so we know 
the beep duration and we can always know uh, at what percentage of the play, uh, of the sound we are by taking a and dividing it by beep duration right so that gives us some sort of a percentage uh, which we can then use uh, to do things I suppose I don't know um, so we can have like an inverse slurp or something mm -hmm. Uh, so we have to be really, really careful. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. Uh, to the two, two, and uh, so if so, we actually start at the hundred percent, and then we go to the zero percent, right? So if P is, um, let's say, greater than uh, some sort of like a 95%, right? If it's greater than 95%, I can um, take that value, right? I can take that value uh, and subtract 95, and that will give me a value that is going from uh zero zero five to zero right so zero zero five to zero right which i can then maybe uh subtract from zero zero five right and that will give me uh you know from zero to uh zero five um cool from zero to zero five but if i then divide this entire thing divide this entire thing by zero zero five and i can probably simplify some of these things right so i can take basically only divide um this part and subtract from one right so that's basically the same uh i can get sort of like a volume thingy right I can get sort of some sort of a volume thingy that I can apply, right? So um, now, so uh, how can I call it? So it's going to be some sort of X, right? And uh, in terms of volume, do we even have a volume? Yeah, yeah, so we're going to be applying it like this. So this is basically what allows will allow us to do like a little bit of an attack, right? And then we can do a similar thing uh for for the so the decay i don't remember which is attack which is decay so i don't know anything about terminology in here so but yeah so that's what i will try to do right so uh, basically at particular range of the percentage i'm starting sort of like trying to control the volume a little bit right trying to control the volume uh, uh okay so what do we have in here uh p missed else uh well in case of an else we can just say that it's one there's probably a way to do some sort of a min and max in here but i don't care because i have not finished this entire thing uh right so we don't really care about that uh all right that's really interesting it's kind of difficult to hear if it uh, fixed the cracks because the the cracks exist on both of the ends of the node if you know what i'm talking about at the beginning and at the end so we only fixed it fixed that thing at the beginning i think right so uh we'll have to do the, the rest of the stuff to actually hear what's going on there um also i would like to have some sort of a constant in here for the for this zero five if you know what I'm talking about, but maybe I'm going to introduce that a little bit later. Mm, so if uh, else if p pi p actually p less or equal, um, you know what? Maybe I'm going to also do like equal zero zero five right zero zero five. Uh, I think we can just use p directly in this case, and otherwise it's always going to be one i suppose right it's always gonna be one 
Um, <clears throat> so that's roughly what I want to do in here. I wonder if it's going to work in Rust, by the way. I think it should it should work. Okay. So let's try to compile. Mm. Didn't fix anything. Uh, did not fix anything. Did not fix anything. Hmm. That is very, very interesting. Um, so. Uh, oh, yeah. Divided by 005. Okay. Didn't help. Mods, ban, perm ban. I'm joking, joking by the way. Uh, so let me see. Uh, <clears throat> maybe that's what we need to have in here. Uh, let me see. Um. I have an interesting idea though. So all of this shit aside, right? So let's just like not play with this kind of stuff, right? Uh, oh, wait. Oh, I see what's going on. Okay, I'm an idiot. It's actually not A. Okay, I, I hope somebody in the chat actually caught that. We have a lot of backseaters in here and nobody actually caught that. Uh, so it doesn't have to be A. It has to be T. Does it? Uh-huh, so it has to be A minus effectively t but it's actually minus this value yeah it's minus this value all right so i think that's what needs to be in here. so it makes the entire thing a little bit complicated right uh but uh maybe that will fix the problem mm. Mm hmm Still doing the thing. Okay, but it's actually kind of getting close, uh, closer there. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Might as well actually put something like, nah, it's not gonna work very well. Uh, yeah, I think this is what I need to do now. Hopefully, I don't know if I'm moving in the right direction. Mm. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah, we did it. Uh, so, uh, the duration is going to be something like this. Maybe we can increase the volume a little bit. Uh, right. So, let's see. Mm -hmm. Paug? Isn't that Paugers? It clipped a little bit when they merged together, but I'm not really sure. Ooh, this one is rather difficult. Oh yeah, I can I can see how they can clip. Uh huh. Yeah. So let's actually make it a little bit shorter. Um. Mm. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to actually uh, keep track of the beep frequency. So uh, let me introduce this kind of thing. Uh, it's going to be beep frequency f32 
All right, and um, beep frequency, initial one is gonna be just beep frequency. Uh, and every time you collide, in fact, um, <clears throat> we're gonna be increasing that beep frequency, I suppose. All right, so it's gonna be self beep frequency plus uh, 20 or something. It's not a correct way of doing that. It's not like a proper scale, All right? Uh, but uh, it's something that we can at least hear. Um, okay. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, probably I didn't even have to do that, but uh, yeah, it's gonna be. So what if we have like 16 seconds of the duration now, the original 16 seconds? So how's it gonna look like? I thought it was going to blow up or something. <laughs> okay, so they still um, actually crack, but this is because we like handle the attack stuff incorrectly. So it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a difficult thing to do. So maybe I need to come up with a, like a better abstraction or whatnot. Uh, but yeah, mm. so. So essentially what we're starting to have in here is overlapping beeps that currently playing. So what I'm thinking is that maybe we need to have a separate entity that maintains the currently playing beeps, right? And then we have to mix them together. Uh, so yeah, that would be actually kind of kind of proper way of doing that. Uh, imagine hundreds of those. Yeah, I, I do plan to actually have hundreds of those and uh, I have a way to actually, like I have an idea on how to make it sound nice as well. Right, so um, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Uh, okay, uh, I might as well actually try to see if it works well with Discord. Right, so let's actually go ahead and upload that to Discord somewhere uh, in one of those things. Uh, just a second. Uh, okay, so I, I hope I don't interrupt anyone's conversations in here. So I'm gonna just go to output mp4, right? So and let's just upload that and see if the Discord will display that properly, right? So. Yeah, it displays it properly and plays it. It feels like it's gonna blow up. Uh, that's actually sh uh, for sure. Um, okay, uh, that's pretty pog. And I have an idea. So we have like a pretty complicated script in here. So and I think um, it would be kind of nice to actually uh, maybe use make files or something for this kind of stuff. Um, not quite sure, not quite sure what's going to be the best way to handle all this. Uh, okay, so I need to remove the sound.rs and uh, yep, so we factored out this entire thing, generate the sound for the video and uh, then maybe later we're going to implement like a different, uh, you know, platform for, for this entire thing. So uh, what I want to do, what I want to do, uh, I want to do a committee committee, I suppose, right? So I want to do a committee committee. Uh, all right. 
generate the sound uh, for the simple version of the animation right so we have a simple version of the animation and we have a couple of other things that left that are left to be done uh, all right so and those things are gonna be I don't know maybe we, I, I'm gonna start like laying out the to do's so the first to do that is very very important here is that so there is a crack when the um, beeps are overlapping okay uh, there are still uh, still clicks when the beeps are overlapping um, probably because uh, of the way we handle uh, fade in out right so um a proper a proper way would be probably um will be probably implementing i uh, will probably playing uh the beeps in a concurrent fashion right so basically uh basically have a queue of uh, of them right so uh, we're gonna have a queue of these things and then we're gonna be playing them and then uh you know uh, retiring them retiring them from the queue when they're done and when you want to play another beep uh, you're gonna be um, you know uh, pushing that into the queue and then uh, to play the current uh, you know the current sound you will have to like mix them up somehow in some particular way so uh, having like a single variable here that handles a single beep is not like really an option uh, all right so probably uh, in concurrent fashion and uh, mixing mixing them uh, in the final uh, sound all right so then I want to have uh, something like this um, so I'm gonna actually put it like that and separate from everything mm. uh, implement a sound for uh, the complex uh, complex version of the animation so we have a couple of ideas on how to uh, make it sound nice basically uh, the more things collide the more the um, they become uh, the the smaller the rectangles become so maybe we can basically do a correlation show so a bigger rectangle will harmonize with a smaller rectangle so when they actually bumping and uh, you know to the walls the beeps that they produce they actually harmonize together so so it sounds nice so the idea is going to be that uh, the resulting chaos would harmonize at least in some way right so that's going to be the idea well we, we can play with that idea and see how it goes okay so implement the complex version uh, and another interesting thing this kind of stuff will be possible after we implement the concurrent plane of the beeps right because we're going to have a lot of beeps playing all the time right so we definitely need some sort of a concurrent stuff here uh, so yeah that's basically it uh, and do we need anything else in here i don't know um so the ultimate goal is eventually going to be implementing the OpenGL renderer uh, open uh, gel renderer and I don't know um, mm, real time generation uh, version yeah that's that's basically what, what I want to do right so we're generating right uh, this kind of stuff right now into the video but I want to also create a version that generates all of that all of that stuff in real time and this is precisely why I was extracting all of the simulation into a separate module so you could take that module and hook it up to OpenGL and ELSA right so something like that uh, so and I want this module module to be reusable for both outputting the video and real time so it's going to be a single sort of core that you can use for whatever uh, thing you want Right, and then um, maybe you'll be able to port it to other graphics API like Vulkan, right, or, or stuff like that, and maybe other um, sound systems, right. So I want this module to be sort of like a cross-platform in some sense. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Hopefully. Uh, right, so, and uh, let me maybe git ignore a bunch of garbage in here so uh, here I think I want to git ignore things like PCM and things like MP4 there we go 
and uh, let me let me see. So what I want to do in here? So maybe I'm gonna just call it like a run. Uh, right, run. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. If you don't have any of these things, uh, warning. Uh, the program uh, produces big files over one GB. <sighs> All right, so uh, git ignore and we also, well, I mean, wave is not going to be the thing. Mm. All right, so what did we have in here? Uh, so let me try to do that. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, and one more thing, Marco Dev, please don't backseat me and then try to convince me that you don't backseat me. That's a guaranteed permaban. Just a warning for the future. Uh, because I'm trying to do work in here. All right, that's it for today. Thanks everyone who's watching me right now. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, have a good one and I see you next time. So uh, maybe next time we're going to continue working on this kind of thing because I kind of want to finish this stuff uh, and see where it goes. Uh, because like uh, having like a you know, actual real-time rendering would be kind of cool because it's like kind of lame to wait for uh, the entire thing to finish up, uh, right? So you want to have a, like a better feedback and stuff like that, right? Okay, so that's it for today. Thanks, everyone. Uh, love you all. Mwah.